Hello, everybody. Welcome to track two. And uh, today we have Alan. And Alan works on technology leadership team at Airbnb, where he mostly focused on threat, and te uh, threat de detection and incident response. And Al Alan really, really enjoyed incidents. So Alan, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so this is how I learned to stop worrying and build a modern detection and response program. So today I'm going to share with you a framework that will help you build a modern detection and response program. You'll come away from this talk with a better understanding of what your program should look like how all the tools, capabilities, and processes should fit together, and how to analyze, build, implement, and evaluate so your program provides immense business value. But first, hi, I'm Alan. I'm a senior staff engineer at Airbnb. Um, I'm also a dad, which you could probably tell by my stunning dad shirt. Um, I live in Austin, Texas with my wife and little two-year-old son, Liam. Uh, here we are in a very giant adult size ball pit, and I almost lost him many times in there. Um, he, was, he was in there a really long time, I got real worried. Uh, and this talk is, in a way, inspired by Liam. Uh, you see, I'm a worrier. Uh, <laughs> and being a parent and a worrier is a very fun combination. Um, I remember when Liam was just a few hours old, barely a lump, and I was sleeping in the little hospital cot that the dads sleep in next to him. And he was in the bassinet, and I was listening to him breathe, because um, I'm a worrier. And then I noticed that his breathing sounded a little different. Now, I've been a parent for about 20 minutes, so everything sounds really different to me. But I'm worrying, uh, so I get up to look at him, and he looks purple. But yes, he does look purple. He's also only like been outside in the world for a little bit. So I don't know if it's like normal purple or like bad purple. Um, but I, I'm, I'm worried about him, but I know what to do. I have a plan. Uh, I took an online parenting class during COVID and I paid very good attention. Um, so I flip him over in my hand, and I'm pat, 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 and he spits up and starts crying. But he's breathing again. He's fine. Um, and Liam gifted me something really important that day, uh, and that's perspective on my worrying. And I realized something. Uh, worrying can be a superpower. Um, there's this research paper out of the University of California, Riverside. It's called The Surprising Upsides of Worry. And in this paper, they argue that while worrying, especially at extreme levels, certainly has its negative outcomes, there's a really cool upside to worry. Here's a quote. Uh, worry illuminates the importance of taking action to prevent an undesirable outcome and keeps the situation at the front of one's mind to ensure that the appropriate action is taken. And when I read that, I said, oh, hey, that's what I do on Blue Team. Um, uh, so worriers, which I will frequently mispronounced as warriors, uh, bring a unique skill to detection and response. We are constantly thinking about what could go wrong, um, but we need to make sure that we have the knowledge to take action. And here's where I see a lot of programs fail. So I've been doing detection and response for a little over a decade, but I didn't start here. Um, I started my career more on the red team side of things, and I got to watch Lots of blue teams fail time after time. And then when I switched over to the blue team and started working in detection and response, uh, I found that myself and my peers, while we were great at accomplishing the technical work, uh, none of us really had any idea what a detection and response program should look like or that we should even have one. Um, we just did our tasks and our projects. It was pretty ad hoc, and we had no bigger picture or strategy in mind. And I think this is one of the major reasons blue teams fail. We're taking lots of action, we are really busy, but we're really making it up as we go, or we copy what we did in our last organization because it kind of worked there. Um, so after making lots of mistakes, I took all those lessons and I built a framework that finally worked for me 
and hopefully it'll help you make a much better detection and response program. And this way y'all can learn from my mistakes and make better, more informed mistakes than I did. Um, I learned something else when I first became a parent. Uh, everyone has advice for you. And some of it is useful and a lot of it isn't. And the reality is that you have to figure out what works for you and your kiddo. Um, but I have found that the advice that's been the most helpful is less prescriptive and provides resources and tools. So when I was building this talk, I asked myself, is this a methodology or is it a framework? And you're like, well, I don't remember the difference. So some characteristics of a methodology are that it's very prescriptive, it tells you exactly what to do, the steps are very systematic, they must be done in a particular order, and there's usually not a lot of room for creativity or customization. But the delivered outcome's usually consistent. On the other hand, a framework has a loose structure, it's flexible, it gives leaves room for other approaches. Um, it still provides you most of the processes and guidelines required to succeed, but in the end, you can still choose what you want to use. And it definitely leads to inconsistent outcomes, but every organization has different lines of business, areas of risk, technical capabilities. So I chose a framework because I want you to be able to apply this to your own program. Um, so as we go through the framework today, think about how you might need to personalize or customize for your own organization. But before we talk about how to build and implement this framework, um, let me put some things in historical context. So the 30 second version of like where detection and response comes from is that late 90s, early 2000s, you get the Security Operations Center, the SOC. They get a little popular. Um, and these spun out of a thing that's been around much longer, the Network Operations Center, the NOC. And initially, uh, SOCs were pretty focused on things like antivirus and IDSs, maybe some firewall if uh, you know, the NOC let them do that. Um, and then more tour tools start rolling in. We start to get SIM and UEBA, Threat Intel platforms, CASB, EDR. Um, you know, we get all these alerts now, so now we need to have SOAR and a data lake to help us automate and investigate. And there's been lots of advances in our tooling. But even if you have all of those, I still think that many organizations are still operating in a legacy model. So let me talk about what I mean when I say a modern detection and response program. So first, a legacy program is reactive. The focus is on alerts that indicate something bad has already happened. And uh, a, good, a good way to know if you're in this is that you find most of your time is spent just trying to get to that alert queue zero. You'll never get there, by the way. A uh, legacy program focuses all its strategy on the technology. Um, when you describe your program, do you find yourself talking about the tools you have, the vendors you do business with, or do you think about what capabilities you actually have and how those empower you to do the things you need to do in detection and response? A legacy program has lots of manual heavy tasks. You might have automation tooling, but if you find that you're doing most of your day-to-day -day tasks manually, then you haven't really invested into thinking about automation capabilities. And finally, and personally, I think most unfortunately, a legacy program operates completely siloed and disjointed from the rest of the organization. This puts you out of touch with the org's technology, it inhibits your ability to work side by side with your partner teams, and you end up investing a lot of time and money in the problems that you should have been trying to solve collaboratively. On the other hand, a modern program is proactive, and that doesn't just mean you do a thing called threat hunting, it means your philosophy of detection is the idea that you want to detect a threat as early in an attack as possible and that there's many signals you can correlate before the something bad has happened alert needs to fire. And instead of being so tool focused, a modern program builds strategy that is business focused. And by that I mean we empower our teams with more than just requirements, but also the context of how what they're working on empowers the business to do what it does. A modern program prioritizes automation. So when you're implementing processes, integrating your tools, your first thought should be, how will we automate this? Instead of creating your manual playbooks 
and sure hoping you're going to automate it in the future. You probably won't. Uh, and finally, a modern program is connected to the business, centralizes functions, workflows, and data, because you can't succeed by doing it alone. You'll never scale. And I saw some of you nodding your head, agreeing, but also, what about the challenges in my way, is what you're also thinking. And I know them very well. Uh, it's the alert fatigue that's grinding any sense of hope that you'll move forward. It's your lack of a budget to get the expensive tools you need. It's hiring and retaining talent, because these roles often lead to burnout. And it seems that you'll never get out of firefighting mode, and the incidents just keep coming. So whether you're a CISO or director, you just want to understand where modern detection and response fits in the overall security program, or if you're a manager building processes, hiring the people executing this type of work, or you're an engineer, an analyst, a PM that wants to understand the bigger picture, uh, this talk's for you. And if you don't know much about instant response, this is also a good talk, I think. So I'm going to help you get to a modern program with a framework to guide us today, methods to help you measure and report how your program is detecting and stopping threats, and along the way, all the lessons I've learned about empowering teams to succeed and overcome operational time sinks. And like all good frameworks, this one is based uh, on work done by people much smarter than me, which is most people, although I'm fairly certain none of them ever worked in information security because we're going to follow the process of organizational design. So what the heck is organizational design, you may ask? Well, Gartner defines it as the process of creating structures, the line roles, workflows. Okay, hold on, before you doze off, I read this book called Organizational Design, a step-by-step -step approach, so you didn't have to. And this book lays out a seven-step process for designing your organization. Uh, I, uh, I made it four steps, because most of you probably haven't had enough coffee to have seven steps. And so these are the four phases of the framework we're going to work through today. We're going to assess and analyze our current state, design and develop our ideal program, which is where we'll spend most of our time, and then we'll talk about when it comes time to implement, how we overcome operational challenges, and then finally we'll evaluate and report using metrics that tell the story of how this program's performing with narratives that sell it. So here we go. So to assess and analyze, we start by asking, where are we and what do we have? So whether you're joining a new team or you've been promoted or you've been tasked or you just work on a detection and response program and you want to level up your current efforts, the first thing you need to do is understand what your starting point is. Do you have anything? Maybe you're in a large program that has uh, detailed metrics that are constantly being reported. Maybe it's just you and some antivirus. Um, now, at a previous job, a few weeks before I started there, my boss to be mailed me this book. And I'm not really a big fan of business or optimization books, but this book had a lot of great information on how to get yourself set up to be successful and productive faster when you start a new job. Uh, not directly relevant to this talk, but it provides a really great tool for applying systematic learning to understanding your current state. And the first piece of advice this book provides is that you need to stop. Stop doing and start learning. Take a breath. Sure, things are probably on fire. Uh, but before we start fixing, we need to first learn. And we need to learn from three perspectives. Past, present, and future. For the past perspective asking, why are things done the way they are? Why, how has this program performed in the past? How were goals set? And were they insufficient or overly ambitious? For the present, are the reasons something was done still valid today? How do people in the organization think about detection and response and how they're doing? And then looking toward the future, are the conditions changing so that something different should be done going forward? If performance has been good or bad, why was that the case? And what behaviors did the program encourage or discourage? And then we're going to ask those questions from four different viewpoints. 
And before we dive into each of these, I will say that if you are starting with nothing, you have been given a gift. Uh, it significantly reduces the complexity since there's little past or present factors to consider when designing. But if you have a team, you have tools and processes in place, you definitely need to do this work, so don't skip it. So first up, we assess the viewpoint of vision and mission. And here you want to think about these questions. What is unique about detection and response at your organization? What unique problems do the culture, the technology, the people at your org pose for detection and response? And then, what are people spending their time doing? And maybe an even better question, what if they spent less time doing X and then more time doing Y? Would they be more effective? So, who do you ask? Well, you ask your team, but who else might you ask these questions? Audience participation time. Customers? Customers. Stakeholders? stakeholders. Who, who, who's our stakeholders? Everybody. Everybody. Can we think of a couple? Legal, there's my favorite. <laughs> Get them in early. Who else? Developers. Yeah, your developers, your IT team, your technology teams. Leadership, they better be on board, right? So here's a silly question. How do we ask? Oh, nicely, of course. Um, so I don't use questionnaires often as a tool. Um, but these are questions that may take time for people to think about. Um, so actually, this is a place that I think questionnaires are actually pretty appropriate. Um, but regardless of how you do it, your takeaways are, what are people doing? Because this tells you what the implied vision and mission is, which, by the way, is probably very different than what's written down. And then what does the organization need from detection and response? So then we assess the viewpoint of our people. We want to understand what skills we have available to us as we're thinking about processes and technologies. We want to make sure that we understand what skill sets we have before we start building. Um, so I'm going to point you to this resource. It's the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. It comes from NIST. It does a pretty good job of categorizing and describing the different types of cybersecurity skills. Um, in NICE, skills are defined as these things called work roles. There's lots of them, um, but to give you a jump start, I've grouped them into like the following detection and response roles. And these are general groupings, and I'd expect you to have responders that are also detection and response engineers. And in fact, I'll talk about, you know, how there's a lot of space for overlap and how I like that. But I found that these roles make it a lot easier to talk about the skills without too much customization. And then I assess. So I created a self-evaluation survey um, and asked my team to rate themselves for each of the work groups. So for forensic analyst, I asked each member, and it comes, each role comes with a description of what it is, what, you know, what needs to be done, and then have them rate themselves. They have no experience, a small baby Liam amount, and then all the way up to like parallel parking during rush hour without breaking a sweat. I did not have them do it anonymously, but you could totally do it anonymously across your team. Yeah, um, depending on the culture, of course. Uh, and then we use that data to create a heat map. Uh, and that visualizes the experiences and skill sets of the team. So now you have an estimate of what skills you have, where you have strengths and weaknesses, and where you have gaps. So then, as you're evaluating your processes and technology decisions, the tools you're building and buying, now you know where to prioritize mentorship, where to target training and hiring. Cool, now we're gonna talk in more detail about processes, and when we start to design and develop, we'll talk about all the processes that I think should exist in a detection and response program, but every organization is different, so let's capture what we have in place today, because maybe it's something you'll add in your process design later on. And you've probably heard of it, but it's a good tool for evaluating processes. It's the Capability Maturity Model Integration Program, CMMI, and you can use it to rate processes maturity. 
Uh, you start with least mature, add initial, where your processes are unpredictable, poorly controlled, reactive, and then all the way up to mature where you're optimizing and your focus is on process improvement. And then you do your discovery, find out what are all the different processes. What's your incident response process like? How do you escalate incidents? What's your triage? Do you have playbooks for different types of incidents? And then rate each process and group them into general themes. Um, <laughs> and then depending on your situation, well, maybe it's not great. Uh, and maybe it's worth calling out how bad it is. So there's also the capability in maturity model, which I got from a very deep, dark Wikipedia following. Uh, and it's a semi-serious way that a captain in the Air Force came up with as a way to evaluate dysfunctional organizations. Um, my favorite level is contemptuous, which is when ineffectiveness has become apparent to the larger organization, but measurements are fudged to make the organization look good while they become more committed to the ineffective processes. Yep, if you know, you know. Um, so cool, now we've obsessed our, uh, assessed our people, our processes, our vision and mission. So let's take a look at our technology. And before you start making a list of all the tools you bought, stop. Technical capabilities are not product categories. So what do I mean by that? Um, first, you might have something called EDR. I might have something called EDR. But depending on the vendor, the tool, how we implemented it, the different type of systems we run, what you're actually using in the tools, our capabilities might be very different. And second, I think product categories are confusing. Um, it could just be me, but if I asked five people in this room what XDR was, I would probably get five different answers. So as we're analyzing and designing our technical architecture, focus on the capabilities, the use cases, instead of the product categories. So instead of being like, I've got EDR, which by the way is endpoint detection and response for folks that may not know, because remember product categories are confusing. Um, we would document capabilities like fileless malware detection, forensic artifact collection, volatility memory imaging, host isolation. And then think about the capabilities outside of your own team's ownership. That could be what you use during incidents for messaging, ticketing, alerting, that stuff's really important too. So that's it. Now we've got an understanding of what you're starting with, the historical context, and where things are currently trending. You did great, you stopped, you learned, now let's have some fun and design and develop our program. And when I design and develop, I like to think about it like we're telling a story. Because stories are memorable. You may never remember anything from my talk, but you'll remember the little story about me patting my little guy on the butt back there and throwing up. Um, our brains are wired to remember stories. Uh, so my son Liam is two, he can't read, surprise, uh, but he can recite this book about Leo going for a swim word for word. Um, so having a mission and a vision statement is cool, but when you start to talk about your program like you're telling a story, that's when it can really start to resonate. So with that in mind, let's start designing and developing. So in this phase, we're gonna create three deliverables. First, we're gonna ask ourselves, what processes do we need in our program design? And processes tell the story of what we do. So to better enable this storytelling, I'm gonna build this thing called a process view. And this is a diagram that gives a visual representation of the processes within our program how they interact with each other, and it's not intended to be an exact diagram. You can make one of those, but it'll be an eye chart. Remember, what you're doing is you're telling a story. So I'll start from an ideal beginning. Our first process is threat modeling, where we build profiles of threat actors, get intrusion sets, and understand what type of threats we care about the most. And the story I'm telling here is that our program is fueled by threat intel. Intel being coming from both internal and external, collected, analyzed, and then disseminated throughout our program. Whether that's in the form of threat briefings, IOCs, or hunt packages. Uh, the story I'm telling here is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. 
we still need the classics, event monitoring, triage, analysis, incident response, forensics. Um, the story I'm telling is that we are proactive. Our intel, often from our own incidents, is used for threat hunting, uh, maybe starting out with simple automated IOC searching and then moving to doing creative data analysis, looking for undetected threats. And then the story I'm telling here is that as we, continuous, we, that we continuously test and improve our program with something called micro-purple tests, tests that simulate threat techniques so we can validate that our detections and how we respond actually work. And then we use those tests to prioritize our logs, our detections, our responses. And the story is that continuous improvement needs to be central to our program so that we can prioritize what's the most important work we're doing, including things that come out from threat hunts, like we have gaps in our application logs. And something I talk a lot about in my life is that visibility without context is never good enough. You can have all the logs in the world, but it doesn't mean they're helpful. If you can't integrate it with your threat intel, if it doesn't really provide you context of your systems, your networks, your applications, your cloud platforms, you want observability. You want to be able to write detection rules that you can actually find known bad, anomalous, or risky activities. Without that context, you can't do it. And threat hunting is a great input to your detection engineering. And so then when our detections fire, all those classics over there, built with automatization, autom automation prioritized, then rapidly triage, analyze, and respond. And then finally, the story I'm telling here is that this program's performance can be measured. And that data is used to communicate how we're succeeding, improving, changing, and investing. And then we can circle back to the beginning where our incident data flows back into our threat intel collection so that we can continue to inform the program with new threat hunts, threat briefings, and detections. And the cool thing about a framework is that you might see things totally different than I do, and that's fine. And you, know, you should talk to me after, I'd love to hear. But then you can zoom out and you can start to see that our reporting and metrics can also inform our red teams, with new scenarios, our security awareness teams with metrics about phishing events so that we can better educate our users and put better preventions in place. And then all of our partner security teams, our production security, our corporate security, so they can build the controls that help prevent the incidents that are actually happening that we're seeing. Cool, now we got processes. Let's take a look at building our architecture. And we're not going to list product categories, right? We care about capabilities. And I start with the process view. Uh, I've tried to do it the other way, but I think it's easier to think about what we need to do before we come up with what technical capabilities we need to be able to execute on them. So here's some resources available that can help you think about capabilities. Um, you're probably familiar with MITRE ATT&CK. Gives you, you know, a really great list of attacker tactics and techniques. And one way I've used this is I'll walk through the framework, which is super fun, by the way, and ask, what capabilities do I need to detect and respond to this? And then I think about it on my Mac systems, on my Windows systems, my Linux systems, in my cloud, on my Dockers. And then we have MITRE Defend, which was released not that long ago. Um, and it's a catalog of defensive techniques. So it helps you answer what capabilities do I need for specific techniques. It's a little bit prescriptive um, and might not be applicable to like your environment, but it does have really great analysis techniques, so I think it really shines there. Tines have this SOC automation matrix. It lists all the common activities most SOCs want to automate. Um, it's a really good starting point when you're thinking about what things you want to be able to automate like alert handling, issue tracking, enrichment, user interaction. And then it has lots of really good examples of how to automate those. Um, and it covers things that you probably haven't thought about, like automating your documentation and change management, because I bet you're all really good at documenting. Thrilling stuff. 
Uh, and then finally, Snowflake have this detection series on Medium about um, building detections and then uh, analogy that to software engineering, which is an interesting approach. So let's go back to the process view and use it to inform our capability architecture. Um, so if we focus on threat intel and think about the types of data we'd like to be collecting about our threat actors, intrusions, maybe just raw intel from Twitter, um, but also actionable intel like early warning signals, dark web postings related to your organization, threats to your brand and reputation, credentials for sale. And then we have to think about how we're going to collect it, disseminate it, and then integrate it across all our tooling so that we can have true intel-driven detection. And then if we switch over to the classics, uh, I think about all the automated capabilities I'll need in blue that support my workflows to do the triage and analysis, and then also the automated capabilities I'll need in red to do the response. And then for my more engineering focused and proactive processes, I think about what I'll need to get observability from my logs, not just collecting, but also normalizing, enriching, aggregating, correlating, giving historical context, and then optimizing so you don't spend your whole budget. And thinking about how you need analytics to detect threat behaviors and malware uh, across all your things, endpoints, cloud, SaaS, containers. And then how are you gonna automate testing so that you can check all the different MITRE attack techniques in all your different environments? And then you can put all those capabilities together and create our architecture view. And I've organized the capabilities into groups that tend to be more closely related. Um, and just as I discussed before, the headline of the story is that we're gonna take our threat intel so that we can enable intel-driven detection, so that our threat behavior analytics, our malware analytics, our micro-purple tests can be directly informed by intel. And then we take all that data, turn it into something that we can use for observability, build detections, generate alerts for automated analysis so that we can trigger our rapid responses that are automated across our various controls. So now we have a long-term architecture toward a modern program. And you prioritize, what do I need most? What's the most important? And then that's how you start working toward your investments, your building, your hiring. So you know what you need to do. You know what technical capabilities you need to make it happen. So then what roles do we need to build and operate these? And to do this, we come back to the roles that we put together at the starting point. And one topic I'll mention here is that I'm starting to see a trend where organizations are posting very specific job titles, like detection engineer or threat hunter. And I don't think there's anything like inherently bad about that. But I do know that like as humans, we don't like to be labeled and limited in our abilities. So I like to think about these as roles that people can move between. People like to vary their experiences, um, but also it makes a team like this a lot less siloed, which is what can really happen and it changes the different silos' motivations. But regardless of how you slice it, uh, now you know what processes and technical capabilities you need, you know what roles you need based on your heat map, what's missing, and what you need to do to fill the gaps. And there's a lot of you that are pessimists, scoffing at this bright sunny day that I just described. I've built these beautifully drawn processes and technical capabilities and I've got this fully staffed team. Sounds like a dream, sounds great. But what about my total lack of a budget for these tools and that hiring freeze? All right, so let's talk about it. Um, so first of all, uh, let's talk about how to make the most of the people you do have. Um, so when I, transitioned from being an engineer to a manager, my perspective changed. Uh, I had to take a step back, think about the bigger picture, and that's where I got this idea of building these different views. Um, I'm back in an engineering role, and I realized that these views are vital for everyone, but maybe especially the people, the engineers, the analysts that are working in it. Because um, these views tell the story of what's the most important thing they can be working on and where they're driving value. 
And then when you are able to hire people, they know where to best focus their time. And this is especially important for those of us that are in operational teams. It's really easy to feel pulled in the many different directions and having a single view that is, this is what we're going to, can really help the team understand. If you're trying to build a new program, but you have a lot of historical debt, lots of noisy alerts, lots of manual tasks, uh, I have found two approaches work really well. The first is to declare bankruptcy. You aren't gonna solve yourself out of this one. Uh, it probably won't fly with leadership. So I also recommend that you try to outsource as much of you, as you can. Uh, time box it, but think about hiring maybe a third party SOC, some contractors, something to throw bodies at the problem so that you can temporarily have your team focus on building the bare minimum of something that works so that you can finally move forward. And then as you prioritize the technical capabilities you need, uh, the inevitable question of build versus buy comes up. Now, I'm an engineer, I love to build. Um, but here's what I'd recommend. Uh, I think a 65% solution is the best solution. Um, and that doesn't mean that we ignore like the basic principles that we need to be able to use this thing with automation, we need to still be proactive, those things hold true. But if you can buy yourself a solution that gets you 65% of the way there, that means your team can focus on the very business specifics or program design specifics that you have. And then of course, while you're building, you've still got incidents, you still are an operational team, and those are always gonna be the priority but especially at the beginning of implementation, push back. Let the less critical things fall on the floor. Uh, we are really good at giving the appearance of being really busy, and that makes people think that things are just fine. Um, but as we'll discuss next, uh, how you report can really open up your leadership's eyes to the reality and get them on board with shifting to a modern program. So let's jump into it. And just like there was a legacy and a modern program, and I think some of you probably have a fairly modern program, but are falling into legacy ways of evaluating and reporting. And it could be preventing you from getting the support, the funding, the headcount that you really need to succeed. And so when I say legacy, uh, I mean you're still thinking reactive by reporting time to detect, time to respond, time to contain, and that's it. Nothing else. Uh, and when I say legacy, it's a report to leadership with the number of events that happened last month in comparison to the amount of events that happened this month without any context. That doesn't help anybody. No one cares. Next slide. It's when you report on what you're seeing without any context of what you aren't seeing. And overall, legacy reporting doesn't tell the business the value your program brings. All they know is some bad stuff happened, that more things happened, more bad things happened this month than last month, and you're busy. A modern program, though, when you report, provides context around the detections in place, describing how threats are being detected and what the impact to business is. Our reporting should focus on what threats we're seeing, can see, are seeking funding to see, and it provides context to the numbers. What are the associated threats? What environments could be impacted, and where do we have visibility? And it quantifies these, at least in a narrative, to the business risk. Like, hey, that ransomware incident, that might have meant that we weren't gonna do business for weeks, at best. So I wanna talk quickly about four ways to evaluate and report. And I've talked a lot about observability, and I think these three questions really simplify what I'm trying to get at. What can we detect today? What threats can we see? And then what can't we see? What's our landscape coverage? Do I have the same threat visibility in my cloud platform do I that I have on my laptops? And then take both of those and answer, what's my overall visibility into threats? And then to answer those questions, I had talked about the idea of micro-purple testing. 
and that is running tests that validate whether you can and can't detect something. So here's an example of what running all those techniques across MITRE and scoring them as pass or fail might look like. And in this hypothetical example, the story is that we've got great coverage of discovery and C2 techniques. But if an attacker gets access and is able to move laterally, they're probably not going to be detected. And that might be bad for business if you've got poor controls between your environment boundaries. Next, we look at the results of running all those techniques across all our different environments, or what I'm calling landscapes. Um, and you can get a different view of what tactics might be less likely to discover. Um, here the story is this organization has pretty good endpoint coverage, but almost no visibility into their containers, which could be a problem if that's where the business apps run. And then to sum it all up, you can provide uh, our hypothetical overview of visibility into threats based on our micro purple tests. You can make an estimation based on the detections you have in place, but maybe you haven't yet tested them, and then weighting those by the priority and prevalence of our environments. And then these three reports tell leadership, these are the different types of threats, which ones we can see and where, and overall how we're doing. And then of course, you could trend it over time, you could bookmark where investments are being made, where hiring is happening, and how you're currently trending upwards or downwards. And then closely tied to that report are our metrics. And for those, alert numbers are good, but instead say, we know what we can see. What threats are we seeing the most and where? Which ones pose the biggest threats to the business? And from what we can see, what are the trends and impact? What preventative controls, investments could reduce the risk so instead of just giving a lot of numbers that might not mean a whole lot to the people looking at them, derive from your events, what are the top threats? What are your top landscapes at risk? And what are the top incident trends that you, the business need to immediately address? And then speaking of incidents, uh, a really valuable tool for evaluating and reporting is just using incidents as a narrative to describe how well the program is or isn't working. You can think about it from the process view, which process surfaced this up, how did triage analysis response go. You can think about it from your technology view. What technical capability caught this? Which one did we expect would catch this sooner? What did we have to do manually versus automatically? And what investments could have made this better? And then we could think about it from our people. Did we have the skills needed to respond? And this is a good time that we can address skill gaps, job roles, and whether you need more resources. So as an example, let's say you have an event where a malicious email, it gets past your email protection solution, and a good thing happens. The user reports the phishing email. So, you might use this event. You can highlight wins. The phishing report was triaged. Your process worked in a timely manner. You did really good analysis. You have processes and the people that can do them. And yeah, they found that the email was malicious. There were multiple recipients. And we found the one person that clicked the link because we had this tool and we had this process and we had the right people so that we could execute a rapid response, isolate the endpoint, delete that email everywhere, and then feed what our analysis said into threat hunting so we can look where attackers might have evaded our other defenses, extracting indicators, so that you could find that, oh, actually there were victims we didn't see because there's gaps in our email logs. And then we were able to respond to those. And maybe it doesn't go well. <laughs> this is a good opportunity to show that there's a need for better investment because Honestly, all the nice graphs and data can go really well and it can be a beautiful picture. Uh, but sometimes a story will go a lot further for leadership to understand your challenges. And so with all those, then you can present a roadmap. We know what we can and can't detect. We know what type of threats are impacting the business. And we know how to make it better. So here's where you make your asks. 
I've got the data to support that you need to reduce the risk of these threats to the business. Here's why we prioritize what we did. And then here's the roadmap to close this. Fund it, hire for it. So cool, we've gotten to understand the current state. We've walked through, designed and developing our own program. We've talked about how to get it done while still operating. And we've gone over the tools you'll need to evaluate and report on how amazing or struggling your program is so that you can clearly communicate your asks. So now, instead of hiring based on the number of alerts or investigations you make, you can make data-driven decisions based on the roles and the skill sets. Instead of threat hunting because it sounded cool, your process view is a story that answers what your program does, how it provides value, and how you measure success. And instead of buying based on what Gartner or other vendors might tell you that you need, uh, you have a vision for your architecture, your capabilities, with a prioritized timeline of what you need and your clear ask to leadership. And instead of telling your boss, yeah, we might detect it, uh, you have metrics that describe what your threat coverage is and performance from previous incidents. So hopefully, you've now learned how to stop worrying and build a modern detection and response program. Thanks. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, um, but also this is my email, and then all of my social handles are on my website. Uh, I write an infrequent newsletter uh, called Meowered. Uh, it has an adorable cat that people love, and the security info is just okay. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, there's a mic in the middle of the room. Thanks, this is a great talk, I appreciate it. Uh, maybe context, so I'm a CISO that also runs IT, privacy, compliance, other groups, CISO plus, they call it. Uh, and what I'm always trying to figure out is how to combine these frameworks together. I love this, but what I'm wondering is how you would include stakeholder management uh, in this, like right away to me, this, what this pops out as is what the business cares about for incident response is when are we back to business, not when did we start the incident, lessons learned. So if you had to include stakeholder management, where would you put that in this? So I usually include it in it, so I'll re I think everyone here, right? We're good, I don't have to repeat the question, that's my favorite. Um, the, so I usually included that stakeholder view in two different places. So in the process view, you have each of those processes, and all of those processes have like their own very detailed design inside of them, right? This is what happens when an event comes in. This is who we need to escalate to. But I find that that can get lost really easily. And so having that zoomed out look of here's all of our stakeholders that we communicate, and then having that almost a stakeholder process communication plan to each one. This is our contract, and this is why I really think asking those questions about like what should we be doing as a program is, are so important, because then when you build that stakeholder contract between them, you've already asked those questions, and so then when you go through your processes of all your micro processes within your program, you know exactly what things are coming out of the program that are going to them and what things are coming back to you as well. So that's usually where I try to like diagram it. Any other questions? Will the slides will be somewhere. Uh, <laughs> if worst case scenario, please reach out to me at my email. I will absolutely send them to you. I did not use Visio. That's a good question, though. Great. I appreciate everyone for coming out to this talk, and enjoy the rest of your day.